was over. At the time, he thought the original Kira sent the video and the death of and was close to the area of his legs. But it turns out, this is all manipulation from the real Kira, who was posing as Mike and Gami. Now, we're finding out that Misha was the same person who she and had to look for the entire time. And neither of them were like, if a police officer gave us a death note and sent it to she, then he wouldn't remember anything that would happen. And that would show that no one would be like this and still was too dark. Now, with that being said, he's already collected all six death notes successfully and has just found out for Misa earlier that Layagami is dead. But if the man was thinking clearly, he'd realize that this is actually a blessing in disguise. If his childhood idol is already dead, then that means there's no reason to come to this secret location because nobody would be waiting for him there. In fact, it's logical to assume that coming here would actually be the worst thing you could do because if anybody's waiting for him, it would be the police. He's just fled the scene of a crime with cops watching everyone on camera, so there's a very high chance he was being followed. Any smart criminal would have taken more precautions and he spent several days trying to move the the trail instead of leaving them into a house with no good way to escape. Since he already has all six death notes, he should have realized that there is no other hero and he's now free to do whatever he wants. If it were me, I would have left Japan and started a new series of killings from a country that had very weak and corrupt institutions because it means the government and police force wouldn't be organized well enough to stop us. I would also make sure I chose a country that did not have extradition agreements with Japan by criminal activity happening in a third world country, the rest of the world would be a lot less likely to be. This would have been the best way to escape the police and eventually dominate the plan, but instead, he walked out into his own trash. His biggest mistake was not having a plan B, and now the cops are confiscating all his death notes, talking about for the rest of his life. When the detective joined the death note task force, Mishima knew he was in trouble and came up with a plan to cover his tracks. First, he found out the man's identity using the Reaper's eyes and wrote down his name in the death note. Then, he modified the video that Light made for his son and instructed Ryu to give both of them to Shia. That way, it would seem like he was the new Kira and no one would suspect him. Snapping out of his memories, the man looks around in horror as the others realize they found the real Kira. And that's when a helicopter is in Light and it immediately fires into the buildings and the men take cover and dodge out of the way in the nick of time. The detective realizes that the government has tracked him down to the office of the death notes, and seeing his opportunity to escape, she had run out of the loop, and she watched him found a way to slaughter them. With no good options left, the man asks the death note to help as he pulls out a page from his death note and decides to find a way out of it. Suddenly, the squad team of the death notes starts flying off and exploding voices, letting the killer write down their names. The men start dropping dead, but it's not enough. Four dozen into the building, and the killer runs back into the loop, but someone shoots him from behind at the last second. Trying to save him, Mishima rushes over and drags the man's body to the but the killer is bleeding out. He won't survive for much longer, and knowing that he's going to die, he runs over the reef and the forces. The investigators manage to find another exit and leave the man for dead, making their way through an area of the scene. But to their surprise, the collar is in the She reassures the man that they won't be killed, but the man only drops a true bomb on him. He really should have Mishima and the killer he murdered her brother in his death. that the death god has written his name in her book and has been to disintegrate It's the punishment for any death god that saves a human life and the police fight is like the president's name is in the year. The next morning, Yu Zaki and his prisoner are being on the road. According to the death god, he is the type of god that is a father of the death god who is transformed. While four of the books were destroyed, two have gone missing. Yu thinks that they're already dying in the world. He walks out of the prison, determined to save as many lives as he can, with no one noticing that the guy walking out looks nothing like the guy he walked in. For one year, how would you be deafened? Let me know with a comment down below. Make sure to watch the nearly 14 years old, completely incapable of speech, and was totally dependent on nappies due to the fact that she had never undergone the toilet trick. Where was Susan Wang? And her story is, without question, one of the most truly horrific examples of prolonged human abuse in the world.
Funny Isaac. Got a fucking cord at. I heard any of them say. Oh, see, nothing went horribly wrong, but I think the cord at this guy dies. Those are my favorite shoes. Teenagers literally yeah, like go, 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 Oh, don't believe me? Well, this random, creepy, and kind of off-putting music that we just overlaid onto this questionable scene sets up for us. Don't be so stupid. People have to be on emotion on their own. Well, how else would the viewer feel ever so slightly scared after watching their fifteenth episode in a row when they do the old, what was that over there, trick? I don't know what that was over there. Because somehow, every time something like this ever happens in these shows, the camera seems to be pointed anywhere except actually over there where the thing is happening. We all know those shows, right? Looking through the channels late one night, filtering through all of the uninspired, generic drivel that one might find in the private lives. Do you find a very specific type of uninspired, generic drivel? Ghost hunting. And in the UK, we've got a show called Most Haunted. A show about a group of people visiting, well, most haunted. They walk around trying to communicate with spirits. They shouldn't be trying to communicate with. Did you watch the mummy? The dead alone. Unless you've got friends, crazy. Why are we? Your heart's content, but if 
would not. Don't do that. They spend the night there, usually in the pitch black, because apparently ghosts have an aversion to light, which I have a hard time believing, on account of them being dead. I can't see myself giving much of a shit if I'm dead, to be honest. And they use various different pieces of paranormal invention equipment, as well as the help of psychics, who have absolutely proven themselves to be incredibly trustworthy people and definitely legit. Not to say that all psychics are full of it. It's not exactly something that I'm an expert on myself. Considering I'm an expert, I'm not literally being an expert at anything. But chances are, they're on TV, or if money is involved, well, let's just say you don't require a psychic to understand their true motives. Big thank you to Kamikoto Knives for sponsoring today's video. Not ideal for ghost hunting. In fact, Kamikoto really wants me to tell you that they're liable for any ghost hunting when they miss Unbelievably sharp edge that you just can't get with other knives. Go to Kamikoto.com and use the discount code BIGWILL to get $50 off on top of Kamikoto's already big sale. Get some cool knives, save some money, support the channel, and flex on some knives. We'll make a reality TV show just about anything. If you've seen any of these ghost investigation shows before, well, you've seen most haunted. I tracked down perhaps one of the most infamous episodes, mainly for one moment in particular, which we'll talk about later. And trust me, you want to see around that. Definitely not just because the YouTube <laughs> God, I'm a slave from the machine. It opened with an immediate scream of multiple different shows of people freaking out. That mood being, this show really wants you to be scared. Like, please be scared. This episode takes away. Because reverse fan snapping was the hip way to enter rooms back then. She's talking about different reports that people have made about this so called paranormal activity in the area. The usual, like hearing things and seeing things. Then she goes on to say, Also, the feeling of utter depression has been experienced. Yes, yes, it has been experienced. Literally everywhere. I don't think I put that one down to ghosts. Unless everybody who suffers from depression has their own little depression ghost following them around and going, Feel bad. Don't feel good things. How dare you be happy? We meet the two psychics, Derek and David, the double Ds, with it almost immediately comes to Derek and just having a full-blown conversation with the spirit. I mean, supposedly having a full-blown conversation with the spirit. He could just be faking it and having a nice little chit-chat to himself, but no one would lie about something like that. Surely not. Interestingly, he is able to give information that could be verified as true, like names and dates of death. Just the manner in which he retrieves said information. He talks to the spirit as if it's a toddler. He lost his life. <laughs> Fair, I'd start doing the whole guy's shit too. Some dude showed up to my resting place and started talking to me as if I'm ready for my nap. Ready to when you turn around. There's an awful lot of things coming through. Immediately beyond camera, the premise of the camera is full of bold cameras. 
nobody ever happens to be looking in the direction where the things occur, which is a common theme that all of these ghost shows seem to have in common. It's as if all the ghosts from all across the world came to their annual ghost meetup and decided that as a collective, that in no uncertain terms, under no circumstances whatsoever, must a spirit do spooky shit in front of a camera. It makes you wonder, right? out of all of these ghost hunting shows that exist, and all of the episodes and investigations that each of these shows have done, no matter what crazy and unexplainable events may unfold, there's still been nothing proven. And I'm not even after like 100% concrete proof the more I think about it. It's just, you can only hear so many bangs in the distance before you say, okay, I'm done with hearing bangs in the distance. Is that all they can do? Do they need to acquire more XP to unlock abilities or something? Are they just grinding out their door knocking abilities? Well, apparently, one of them has gained the ability of possession, as Derek just starts walking around angrily spouting off bullets and punching things. Surprisingly, the crew is not alarmed whatsoever. In fact, this must be somewhat of a regular occurrence for Derek, because one of the crew members simply walk over to him and give him a big hug. Oh, our psychic's been possessed by this angry spirit who we've been told is incredibly agitated and violent. Better give him a hug. Don't worry, ancient demonic benevolent being. Everything will be fine. For a show whose entire purpose is about finding proof of the supernatural and life beyond death, they don't seem to care all that much about the whole demonic possession thing that's just occurred. I don't know. You'd think in this kind of industry that this sort of thing would be somewhat of a big deal. Well, Derek clearly did. tie them down and perform some sort of exorcism of a priest. But maybe this is the quick and easy way of performing an exorcism that the church don't want you finding out about. Priests hate him. This is one simple trick to perform an exorcism. It does beg the question, how was something like this discovered? It reminds me of another question that I've been puzzled about for many years. How did the first person realize that they actually What the fuck is up with that dude? Animal molestation is like the back of the top of the town. They always do this thing which is common across all paranormal investigation shows, where they take a completely normal, totally rationally explainable situation and blag it into something far more scary than it actually is. They might hear a door way off in the distance make a creaking noise, and then proceed to say something along the lines of, there's absolutely no doors in this area. How could a door possibly make a noise here? That doesn't make any sense. Totally forgetting it, or conveniently omitting the fact. Some kind of incredibly large old structure that are known to make noises simply due to the age of the materials used to build them. Without forgetting, there's usually plenty of ways to house the animals and ways to enter the room. Things start to get really interesting when we decide to work out making a glass cup. We've all seen it in horror movies, we've all seen it in We know what we're going to do with it. They replace them. Absurd. So they freak out in the slightest noise that they hear in this building. But when their supposed psychic becomes possessed and the glass apparently begins to move all on its own, nobody seems to give a shit. But it's interesting. And saying that, isn't it incredibly convenient that in the few hours that they've been here, they hear noises, had a possession, and watched a glass move on its own? Well, I'm not saying that it's fair, but what I am saying is that that's one hell of a system that would certainly make for good TV. I think the producers will be too. At least at the end of the episode, the sun comes out and comes spooky back to the sky. They do acknowledge that any of the reasons have just been environmental, Derek's possession should be taken with some skepticism. We have to treat his possession with some sort of skepticism. Some skepticism is rather an interesting way to put it, because the whole possession thing was discovered to be completely bullshit. What? Could it possibly be? It would later be revealed that Derek was being the entire thing, resulting in him being asked to leave the show. As the person who claims to be possessed by the show, they know. Everybody already knows it's fake. 
You think TV is real? Dude, the news isn't even real anymore. Anyway, Most Haunted is the show that I'm most familiar with. So I wanted to see if they do it any different from Cross the Pond. And when it comes to American ghost hunting shows, well, there's a lot to choose from. I like I did with the show. Uh, uh, A bunch of people go to some spooky old place, somehow manage to capture barely anything of note on camera, and use devices to detect or communicate with the dead, because it's common knowledge that spirits like to communicate using Fisher-Price toddler phones. But because it's America, of course it's big and expensive. Get those tiny-ass McDonald's cups out of here. We're drinking from a reservoir, son. In this episode, the group are investigating what they call a lunatic asylum, which they've covered in the past. They may be calling it a lunatic asylum, right? Is it a for the ghosts? Being here in Trans-Allegheny Lunatic Asylum, you've got to be prepared for anything. Perhaps something a little more subtle, like a psychiatric hospital? Oh, you're a woman in the 1800s. You lunatic. From the very start, I've always got high expectations about the episode. As they said last time they were here, they witnessed people being pulled away and dragged into rooms by ghosts. But here's a thought. Perhaps if you didn't go around calling them lunatics, maybe they wouldn't go around dragging you in rooms. In dealing with lunatics, and for some reason, the common rule across all of these ghost hunting shows is the lights need to be turned off. Okay, in most haunted, that place was a literal prison in ruins. But I'm pretty sure that this is an actively maintained building. We see it clearly has electricity. What? A ghost scared the light. The show also does this rather deceptive thing, adding sound effects and ominous music to the background. An argument could be made that they're included to enhance the viewer's experience, but let's be real, they're included into trickery and fight or flight, making them think that there's actually something to be scared of. But in actual fact, it's just a couple of brains that are talking to themselves. It'd be far more interesting and actually believable if they left all of that stuff out. It just takes away from the real nature of the show and just makes me feel like I'm like a conjuring or something. The conjuring already exists. If I wanted to watch that, then I'd go watch that. But apparently this show doesn't know about the thing called pacing because it wastes absolutely no time in building up tension or anything like that. Things just immediately begin to happen. With one of the crew claiming that they can feel someone pulling on their shoulder and they try to read I feel like something on my shoulder. Yeah, no shit, they don't want you reading those. Patient records are supposed to be confidential. A live or dead, I think I have a bit of a problem with some dude strolling into my hospital. Oh, sorry. Digging through my records and finding my extensive history of extremely large hemorrhoids. The show wastes absolutely no time when it comes to showing you the fake stuff. I mean, that's good stuff. As soon as they put down a movement sensor and ask a ghost to trigger it, the sensor gets triggered. Is your name Jane? <laughs> I guess the ghost is a people pleaser. The sensor to communicate with the spirit. They have the spirit set it off to answer it. Yes. We're proceeding to just have a full blown interview with the ghost. Yeah, they're interviewing ghosts now, I guess. Step aside, man, to be fair. It's ghost hunting this time to show. I guess that it's just an average day at the office for these guys, but their reaction is dead. Without fail, something will happen. These ghosts really love the spotlight, huh? That sort of behavior essentially translates to the entirety of the show and everything they end up doing. Like either they're really good at coaching their spirits, or the producers are getting a little overzealous with the ghost of the door knob. So... So... Anything that one of the crew might see somehow never manages to be kept on camera. They're all walking around with their own personal camera, following the Doing. But as soon as Mr. Ghostman happens to look over here, that's when all the crazy stuff starts happening. If we're lucky, we might get to see a little orb floating across a doorway or something. But is that a paranormal orb, or is that a piece of dust or a flake of paint falling from the ceiling of a couple hundred year old building? Or well, how they always jump to these massive conclusions the size of your mum? Okay, I'm sorry, I had to fit another little mum joke in here. I'm sure she's really sweet, she's 
probably a really lovely lady. She would probably really like me. But if you'll be needs to have their audio game dialed up to 11, so that point that we'd be lucky to hear a faint part from one of the hosts amongst all the static, then proceed to say things like, he's a shirt which sounds like a little girl's voice. Yeah, sure. hundreds of lobotomies in this facility? Sure, why not start pissing off the tormented souls who are doomed to spend eternity within these walls? Be straight up asking to be yanked into a room by one of these ghosts. Like if these You've guys done are it. Real, actually true professionals and believe